Houston, or Rob, as most of us know him. Um, Rob is the executive director of the Global Pro Bono Bar Association, as well as an international arbitration practitioner and pro bono coordinator with KNL Gates. He has a wide range of experience from complex cross-border matters with a key focus on public international law to investment treaty arbitration. Next, we have Vishalji Chaudhary, who is the project lead um, at South Asia for uh, A4ID, a lawyer by training. Vish, as he's known to those of us uh, who work with him, has a keen interest in constitutional law, criminal law, professional ethics, and international law. He has extensively published in these areas and has spoken at a number of international conferences on these areas of practice. And last but not the least, we have Jonita Brito Menon from Trust Law. Jonita is a qualified lawyer with extensive experience in criminal litigation and working for the rights of human trafficking survivors. At Trust Law, she leads the Asia team in the delivery of pro bono legal services and projects in the region. Um, Emmanuel, perhaps we can turn to the next slide. Great. Um, and once again, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the co-presenters uh, for supporting this session. Um, let me quickly walk you through the agenda we have planned for you over the next hour and a half or so. Um, I'll briefly introduce uh, the session, uh, and then we will run a poll on Mentimeter and revisit the question that I posed a few minutes ago as an icebreaker. I'm going to repeat the question for those of, of you who've joined again, uh, who've joined us now. Um, the question that we urge you to think about as an icebreaker, uh, make a mental note of it, is your first experience with pro bono and perhaps a lesson or two that you learned from that experience. Okay. Um, once we go through the poll and the ice meet, uh, icebreaker, we will then have a group discussion followed by a breakout group session and then close out. This session is designed to be interactive, so I would request your support and participa participation at every step of the way. Please do keep your videos on when possible and do not hesitate to hit the unmute button if you have any insights, comments or questions that you'd like to share with the group. Okay. Moving on, um, to quickly introduce the session and what the aim of the session is, um, it is to discuss how clearing houses are currently working with legal teams and bar associations to create dedicated resources for their pro bono activities and the gaps and opportunities to further strengthen such resources that can help legal teams be ready and agile to address humanitarian crises such as the Afghanistan or the Ukraine a crisis or a global pandemic like COVID-19. These resources can be in the form of a dedicated pro bono uh, coordinator or committee to pro bono targets, to awards or appraisal systems to recognize and encourage lawyers, to creating evaluation systems to assess the impact of pro bono work undertaken. With that, um, let me move on to the icebreaker and whole parts of our session. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, so again, the question we posed to you was to, for you to share uh, very briefly your first experience with pro bono and a lesson or two that you learned from that experience. So who would like to volunteer uh, to unmute themselves and share with us? Any volunteers to, to kick us off? Okay, I can go first. And um, interestingly enough, my first experience with pro bono is um, after I joined Trust Law, actually. Um, prior to that, um, my work, even though it was in the development sector, it couldn't be counted as pro bono, as all of us who attended the last few days of the conference would know by now. Um, so if I talk about pro bono, I think my, my first instance of actually looking at pro bono in action has only happened after I've joined um, Trust Law. Great. Thanks, Jonita. Um, wish I'll, I'll come back to you, but just because, you know, Jonita said that her first brush with pro bono was Trust Law. I think that was the same case with me. Um, my first brush with pro bono was about you know, three years ago when I joined pro bono and um, it's been a joy right to know that there are people out there 
um, who are willing to you know, share their time and resources to support um, organizations and people in need. But I will come back to you, Vish, since you raised your hand. Um, jump in. Yeah, thanks very much. I think uh, so. Mine was slightly complicated because although it was uh, with a fluoride, so that's the first time I, you know, actually heard that there is this uh, sort of organized uh, thing which works as pro bono. But at that time, I was a professor, uh, so it was at a university setting, and it was with a fluoride because I remember at that time there was a talk where Educates for International Development gave insights into what is pro bono, how do you do it, what are the benefits, what are the business sense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Uh, yeah, that was my first brush and using uh, kind of the model, we worked on a case, um, uh, a few cases actually, and that was, uh, yeah, my first experience. Great. Thanks, Vish. Anyone else want to volunteer? Well, if you don't mind, I would like to share my experience as well. Um, I remember I started working on pro bono even just in the first few months of my legal career, I was working in a, in a human rights litigation firm, Daily and Associates in Hong Kong, and we have to provide like urgent assistance to asylum seekers who just arrived in Hong Kong and faced the risk of being removed. So uh, we, I, I still remember there was a number of occasions that I need, to, I need to rush to the airport to see the client, get instruction, prepare, uh, prepare the, the uh, letter to the immigration department and try to um, make sure that the client has a chance for a flight full and fair screening of their claims here in Hong Kong. I really think that it's a very like, it's a horizon broadening experience. Um, before working on pro bono, I never know what has happened on that side of the world uh, on, and also the situation of some of, our, uh, some of the country from, of our clients. So, I, I really think that those experiences has changed my, my life and also my, my perspective uh, towards the um, situation here in the world. Interesting. Thanks, Aaron, for sharing that experience. Um, I see Benita's hand was up, uh, but you know, just before I come to come to you, Benita, um, I encourage everyone to either you know turn on their cameras, turn on their speakers, and 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 tell us about it, or use the chat function to to you know write it down. Um, the idea is to be uh, become interactive early on, and you know share your experiences with the room. Um, yeah, Benita. Thanks, thanks, Anita. So my first experience with pro bono was over eight years ago when I joined I pro bono as well uh, from a corporate law firm. I uh, didn't have much of a brush with pro bono work before that. And uh, it was a completely new experience for me. And to see that how corporate lawyers or lawyers in our network were taking pro bono work as seriously as they would take paid work um, and, you know, looking forward to completing the projects as professionally as possible in the same timelines, etc and working closely with them on that. So that was quite interesting to see, um, to see how pro bono work sat uh, alongside their paid work or the, you know, what they would they do in their day-to-day -day job. Uh, and that was over eight years ago. Interesting. So it seems that all of us, uh, our first brushes with pro bono were when we started actually working. Um, anyone else um, have an experience that they'd like to share? How about you, Rob? Um, what's been your experience? Well, sure. So I, I guess I would probably count, even though it was, was still in kind of a law school setting, I would count the time that I spent in the human rights clinic over at the Sciences Po Law School in Paris. I was there to do a, a one-year master's program. I had an opportunity to get involved in an environmental uh, project that was looking at, at Ecoside for uh, an organization that was focusing on that topic. It was really a great opportunity because even while I was a student, you know, you get an opportunity to kind of plug in and get involved with others who are in that program gathered together from other countries to look at, at a global issue. So that was kind of my my kind of global brush with with pro bono. I know a lot of times folks will look at pro bono and think of it as as representation of one individual, uh, but pro bono has a lots of different manifestations. And, and I was happy to have, you know, uh, a slightly different one to start up. And um, goes to show how important it is to start young. Um... Great. Uh, I can see Karwaki's hand up. Um, yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, Namita. Uh, so uh, my first 
I'm sorry, I think my video was not working. Yeah, so now it's on. So my first brush with pro bono was uh, when I just started uh, my career in law after my law school. I remember doing an internship with an organization in Odessa in India. It was one of the southern districts of Odessa where uh, we actually were uh, uh, working with tribal women who were uh, abandoned by their family members and they were staying in a shelter home. So we helped them uh, start their life again and help them with uh, filing cases against uh, abusive um, family members. So that was my first brush and that is when I decided you know, in future, taking up something uh, pro bono or doing something in this area. And then when I uh, started working with I pro bono four years back, I actually got an opportunity to do it full time. So yeah, that's how I started uh, doing pro bono. Lovely. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, so I think if there's no one else who wants to speak up, um, I'm not seeing any hands. One hand. Oh, that's kind of lovely sign. Okay, I guess then um, you can continue to use the chat function to put in your experiences. We'd love to know more about, uh, you know, your first brush with pro bono, um, and yeah, and and I think we can move on to a pulse poll that we created for you on a fun little application called Mentimeter. Um, so the so we have the link and the QR code before you and you could use either your mobile phone to scan the QR code or put in the link on your laptop, whatever device you're using um, to open Mentimeter um, and uh, you know get on there and, and I'll see you there. Um, so I just realized that the voting code to enter is not on the slide. So let me just put it down for you on, in the chat box um, and you can use that to get on to the poll. Just to repeat it, the voting code is 6238-2382. Um, let me know if you have any trouble getting onto it. Oh, okay. Somebody who's already on and has begun voting. Um, so let me quickly switch screens um, so that we can all see results um, in real time. Um, okay. There you go. So people are getting on and they're starting to vote. Um, so the first question we had for you was how do you coordinate your pro bono activities? Um, do you have a pro bono coordinator, a pro bono committee, pro bono lead or a partner, or do you have other ways to coordinate your pro bono activities? Give it another 30 seconds. Okay, so seems like nobody in the room has a pro bono lead. Oh, okay, there you go. Okay, someone has a pro bono leader partner. Okay. Great. Um, so can I ask those who chose the other option to perhaps come in and tell us what other ways do you coordinate your pro bono activities? So I can't see if people have their hands up. So please feel free to unmute yourself and, and start off. I can I can go first, Nanita, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, great. So, I mean, obviously, as we uh, we come from I pro bono, um, a clearinghouse and, and more, uh, the way we coordinate our pro bono projects would be different from, say, an in-house legal team or a corporate law firm. Um, or uh, any other association. So it's our team who gets involved. So instead of having one pro bono, co pro bono coordinator, it's one of our program officers in the team uh, who would get involved on pro, uh, pro bono activities and projects. And then we would take that forward to, to relevant members of the legal community who can get involved in the project. And then that person and a couple of other members of the team 
get involved uh, on our, all aspects of the project and take that forward. So it's not just one person who's coordinating, it could be more than one and different members of the team would get involved in different jurisdictions depending on the nature of the project. Okay, interesting. Um, anyone else, perhaps someone from the law firm who can give us a law firm perspective? No? Okay. Oh, uh, Vish, you have your hand up, I can see. Wish you on mute. Sorry, I knew this would happen at some point. Uh, but yeah, so I was saying that, uh, you know, I'm going to switch my hat and actually uh, from my legal practice days, I think one of the ways we coordinated was really ad hoc. And that really, um, I think, is the way a lot of chambers and firms work, not just in um, India, but around the world. And, you know, you just find clients and whoever comes to you, you will help them on it in an uh, ad hoc basis, which I think now I see the change happening especially in the region, but um, yeah, that sort of ad hoc uh, help where you just help as and when somebody uh, comes to you. And it, it worked in some ways because of the flexibility, but it had its downsides. Okay. Um, I, I also see Thien E. So, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, Thien, you had your hand up. Perhaps you wanted to jump in. Oh, okay, jump <laughs> in. ဒီရုံကြီးမှုကျမတို့ခိုင်မြဲလာပြီဆိုရင်တော့ဟာတော့သူတို့ရဲ့အဲလိုအပ်နေတယ်ပေါ့เนาะအဲဒီမှာရော
So it seems like we have a pro bono policy, we have a formal criteria. Okay, so this so there seems to be a pro bono policy in place as well as a criteria on the types of pro bono matters lawyers can do. Um, anyone who wants to come in with the other option they selected and tell us what it is that we're missing on this slide. Okay, uh, seems like there are no takers to this answer. So we'll just have to keep that other under wraps. <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on to the next question, which is how do you encourage your legal team to do pro bono? There are quite a few options. So please take your time um, to read through them and select what best suits you. Okay. So internal recognition or awards, great. Um, that's kind of the front runner currently. So some percentage of answers also are for pro bono targets, um, mandatory or optional, having, having pro bono targets. Okay. And it seems like the next one is pro bono being covered in induction for new starters. Okay. Um, just checking is does anyone want to come in here with responses to any of the of the options? Um, any additional insights? Oh, Benita, you have your hand up. Sure. Thanks, An thanks Anita. Um, many of the firms that we work with, uh, particularly in the UK and in South Asia as well, what we've seen is, you know, there is a combination of these things, actually. Um, pro bono partners or senior managers supporting or, or pushing the agenda for pro bono definitely is one uh, great way to get, um, you know, the junior lawyers involved. And internal recognition uh, on pro bono has is again something that we've seen has definitely worked and when pro bono work is considered in performance appraisals um, and part of their career progression as well and then obviously then you have the technical aspects such as counting as fee earning hours but i think it's the internal recognition and uh, support from their supervisors and partners which we think uh, is has been quite effective i agree um i think this is something that trust law also has seen that um this is a great way, you know, internal awards, a recognition is a great way to incentivize pro bono. Um, I saw Vish's hand up to Vish, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, sure. I think all the answers are actually quite comprehensive and they're very, you know, if you've taken a broad approach to it. But the only thing that I'd perhaps add to this uh, is because I think generally a lot of the law firms are not very new to pro bono. They think of it as charity. Uh, and I think we um, at a for id make at a point that you know it's we obviously expect a very high level of work but we also are very clear that uh, when you're doing pro bono you're doing it because it also makes sense for you and the way we do it is because there's a very strong if nothing else very strong business case to be uh, doing pro bono right so we are i think that is one of the things that i just sat there to make and inculcate the sense of business case for pro bono other than of course it being doing good uh, there's also a very strong business case uh, to be doing it so i think that's one of the reasons why um, some of the law firms that i personally have interacted with uh, would do pro bono absolutely that's a great point um making a business case having a reputational angle to it definitely works in um, promoting pro bono um great okay so then let's move on to the next question 
Okay, so this is a question where you can put down any answer that you have for this. Um, so what are the challenges, if any, you face that prevent or limit your team's ability to dedicate more pro bono hours? And you can put in multiple responses for this question too. Finding the right project, conflict against business interest. Okay. Unorganized and ad hoc. Capacity of the team. another conflict with business multiple verticals of work immediate crisis situation which needs more time um, that's definitely something we're going to be touching upon at the end towards the end of the session in our group discussion oh, interesting um, someone says that the tend to find that the busiest lawyers do the most pro bono. I think they're very true. Lack of training for the team, complicated legal landscapes. Very interesting answers. Um, I think as clearing houses, it gives us a lot of insight in, on potentially how we would support on these issues too. We'll just give it another minute and see if anyone has additional insights that, we, that they'd like to put down. Okay, um, let's then move on. Um, I'm sure we'll be covering a lot of the responses that we received in this question through our group discussion. Um, so I won't linger on this for too long. Okay. Um, the next question we have for you is, how has your organization responded to unexpected... Oh, sorry. Someone seems to have stolen the screen from me. Let me see back. Okay, there you go. Um, so how has your organization responded to unexpected global situations to provide pro bono support? Have you designed special response teams, partnered with local NGOs and provided support, or initiated a specially funded project, or have another way that you approach this? So partnering with local NGOs and initiating specially funded projects seems to have the upper hand here. Um, so while we receive responses, I'm very curious to understand um, those who voted for special response teams. Does, you know, could one of you who voted for that come in and, and tell us a little bit very briefly about what that looked like? Yes, Vish, jump in. Thanks. Uh, so I'm very happy to, uh, you know, go with this without obviously giving names because a lot of this was um, very, very confidential. So I can't divulge name. Uh, but we uh, we did receive some requests where uh, urgent assistance was needed on a number of things. And this was also in an area where we hadn't previously worked uh, in as much um, experience as we would have liked to. So we had to go through our legal partners and we had to get them across the table and uh, we were quite surprised and very pleasantly so because the response we got was really really good um so there is that appetite to uh, ask for it as well as to give it and um it it, it worked really well in terms of um, everything starting from the logistics all the way to what um, the response was needed and what it was and i think uh, also one of the things that we work on is theory of change and how uh, the impact that we measure is on different projects and in this case the impact was actually quite um instant 
Uh, so it was, you know, like uh, very, very quickly that we could see that here's where we provided support. This is how we did it. And there we have the result within a few months, uh, which I think was quite a uh, rewarding experience in more than one way. Thanks, Vish, for sharing that. I think um, from just to quickly share something about what Trust Law did, um, again, without naming names, is, um, you know, when the Ukraine crisis um, came up, uh, you know, we reached out to, to our partners to see who would be available to provide immediate assistance. And when we received requests for immediate assistance from our NGO and social enterprise members, we were able to, um, you know, make quick connections quicker than our usual timelines. Um, so we have in that way responded to uh, unexpected situations. Uh, Rob, you have your hand up. Do you want to come in here? Sure, absolutely. So when, when it comes to designated special response teams, and I saw flashed for a moment, you know, a reference to COVID-19. So recently, the Global Pro Bono Bar has been uh, organizing a, a number of, of, of response teams like that. In 2020, in fact, there was a situation where we had a student-focused initiative where we were bringing together students, some in Asia, some in Australia, some over in the United States, uh, into teams, you know, basically into intern teams so that they could focus on some of our core projects and to start to move them forward while they're also learning some, some um, uh, additional lessons and, and, and discussion groups about legal professionalism and related topics. And we did that because there was a request from a law school that was basically saying as a result of the pandemic, that their law students were not able to get into the jobs that they had had tried to line up. That's one thing from 2020. More recently, we've been working on a number of projects, including one that brings together about a dozen uh, legal um, academics and also professionals focused on one, one project that's in, in connection with the situation that's over in Ukraine today, uh, where each person is working on an individual basis. And it's uh, these are folks who are basically giving of their time and of their their um, legal education and resources and background to try to uh, advance a project uh, together, even though they're not all in the same law firm, uh, even though they're not all in the same educational institution, uh, that otherwise it may be difficult to, to move forward if there were just one institution trying to shoulder the burden of all of those resource needs. So that's what I would share on this. Also, one other thing that I should mention is that I'm, I'm here today, of course, even though I, I have some insight, um, because I act as a pro bono coordinator, uh, in in um, uh, you know uh, the commercial practice of law as well, uh, and uh, you know in my day job, uh, here I'm I'm here to speak uh, on behalf of the Global Pro Bono Bar Association as the executive director. Ours is an all volunteer organization, and so when I speak today, I'll be speaking on behalf of the Global Pro Bono Bar. But I may also have some thoughts to share from the commercial uh, legal perspective as well. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. We'd be happy to have both perspectives, um, and definitely, um, I think. You made a good point about not having one institution be burdened um, and, and diversifying there, especially with student help. Um, thank you so much. Um, okay, let's do we have a question for you. Okay, we've reached the end of the poll. Um, great. Well, then let's move on to the next uh, part of our session, which is, I believe, a good discussion. Um, can I ask Emmanuel to put back the, the slides that we Thank you. Okay, um, great. So while that's being set up, let's begin. Um, and again, to all of the attendees and participants, um, you know, please feel free to jump in uh, when given an opportunity to to add to everything that um, you know we're saying here. We'd love to hear your thoughts and your insights too. We wanna to make it as interactive as possible. Um, so yeah, with that in mind, let me pose the first question to Junita. Um, so Junita, can you tell us a little bit about how uh, Trust Law has supported legal teams with the development of pro bono infrastructure? Yeah, thank you, uh, Nandita. Can everyone hear me clearly? Great. Okay. I see heads being nodded. So I take that as a yes. Um, so yeah, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you uh, for, for joining us today. Um, I think um, this this is probably one of the, the spots where I'd say Trust Law has had um, a very good and very structured approach to contributing um, towards, you know, um, pro bono infrastructure development, mainly because, and I, and I say this um, because I think Trust law has taken that effort to put down a definition 
by looking at what is accepted around um, the, the globe. Um, so I, I'd start with saying, firstly, you know, just looking at a definition of pro bono, which aligns with the thinking of many legal service providers, um, where we look at uh, pro bono as the provision of free legal uh, advice or assistance, representation and research by a qualified lawyer for people of limited means or organizations that have a social, uh, environmental, humanitarian, uh, cultural, or community focus. Um, now, of course, you know, uh, over the last uh, three days for all of us who attended the conference, there have been so many deliberations on what is accepted as pro bono and what is not accepted as pro bono, and what's the difference between pro bono and legal aid. Um, and, and which is why I, I wanted to take this time today to kind of just um, highlight that as much as it sounds really technical and probably the lawyer in me comes out very strongly over here um, to, to hold us to um, the letter of, um, you know, uh, grammar and, and language, um, I, I definitely feel it's, it's, it's important for us as organizations that have been working, um, you know, in, in, in the field for over 10 years to, to kind of come to this place now where we we set these definitions because once they're set and established it's easier it, it's not only easier I think it's more effective for us to see impact it's more effective for us to monitor and evaluate how we are functioning um, and so when, when you ask me this question um, that's that's one of the reasons why I've gone first to the definition um, but in looking at um, infrastructure per se. Um, one of the, the tools that um, Trust Law has created is the Championing Pro Bono Guide, and it's, it's easily accessible on our website. Um, and it gives an overview to law firms and lawyers on how, um, you know, how they can start off with pro bono. And, and what it does there particularly is it actually defines what pro bono infrastructure would be. Um, and I, I think you you kind of like led us to this point with the, the, the poll questions that you brought up, right? Um, what is pro bono infrastructure? Um, from, from our understanding, um, I would say, you know, having a pro bono coordinator in terms of being able to coordinate pro bono or having a pro bono committee that also serves to uh, coordinate pro bono or establishing pro bono policies. I, I feel those are the fundamental basics to uh, develop pro bono infrastructure. Um, and, and what we've seen, um, most of you would also be familiar with the index of pro bono uh, that trust law brings out annually. Uh, the last one was brought out in 2020. Um, and we're, we're going to launch the next uh, this year in 2022. Um, I don't know if anyone else is getting feedback from another mic right now. Um, so if it's possible, uh, requesting our participants to please mute yourselves. Okay, great. Um, sorry, I get distracted extremely easily, especially because I'm sitting in a corridor also where there are people walking around. So extremely sensitive to sound right now. Um, but coming back to, okay, um, coming back to, um, yes, um, why I brought up the index of pro bono is what we've noticed um, in, in 2020 was 250 firm, 215 firms submitted responses. And the most interesting ones of them, uh, like the most interesting learning that I could pick up, which I thought would be valuable to share over here was 87% of the respondents that's, that said they did pro bono um, actually had a pro bono coordinator or a committee or a policy in place. Um, and and like 11% of the respondent firms said that they had all three. So that's a pro, uh, you know, all three components of a pro bono infrastructure in place. I feel this is extremely important for us to understand when we talk about wanting to promote pro bono or, you know, develop a culture for pro bono, we need to be able to establish that. And it's very important for us to identify the elements that come together. So, um, that's definitely one area in which I think just being able to identify and being able to agree on it um, helps us develop the infrastructure. Um, then, of course, you know, providing associated materials, so um, access to types of guidance, whether it is a pro bono policy, mission statement, or even, uh, you know, 
pro bono client uh, criteria um, in law firms or even for uh, lawyers who individually work for pro bono. I feel that itself also develops a system of, um, you know, the infrastructure. Um, and then, of course, come the auxiliary aspects like options to encourage pro bono, uh, elements of pro bono evaluation, um, options to showcasing your work. I think uh, Jessica in the chat put down a very important point, being able to know your impact. Um, there's nothing better for lawyers um, to, to, you know, want to be excited or interested in pro bono than knowing the impact that it has. And I feel that's, um, that's a very motivating factor. And I, I wouldn't say just for lawyers, I think as human beings, right, if you um, know where you're headed or, or you know what's going to come out of it, you're more motivated, you're more inclined, you're more encouraged to, to participate in something. Um, and I think one of the simplest things that we've done to kind of uh, highlight the, the aspect of like developing pro bono infrastructure is a very simple checklist that is part of the championing pro bono guide. It, it, it's a simple one, uh, you know, lawyers or law firms could sit, take it very easily and then identify which are the areas they want to kind of develop for um, pro bono infrastructure within their firms. Um, and, and, and I think that's, um, that's, that's a good enough start for now. Um, and definitely, uh, occasions like these and opportunities like these give us, um, the space to ideate and identify other ways, um, that we can develop pro bono infrastructure. Thank you so much, uh, Jarita. That was very insightful. And I think you made a great point about perhaps first defining, uh, what pro bono is as a foundation to take to setting up an infrastructure. I'm, I'm just you know, going to bring the attendees and co-presenters in here for a quick second and see if anyone has a different definition to pro bono than the one that Jonita uh, put out. OK, I can see Karuvaki's hand is up. Jump in, Karuvaki. Thank you so much, Nandita. Uh, not a different opinion, of course. Uh, adding on to what Jonita said, of course, there is a, it's the, the importance of having a guidelines and having a pro bono guide is, of course, important. And we share that with our partner lawyers and volunteers. But also sometimes we do support them in most of our cases by providing them that extra hand of help in uh, projects where the timeline and the deadline is uh, quicker than they expect, like say the turnaround time is a day or two or a week, then we help them and we work together on a project with them. It's just not managing, but we also do the work along with them. And we tell them that we are here to support you in-house and our in-house programs team, one or two people, uh, we assign it to one project and then they work together with the law firm, a lawyer, say uh, uh, like an organization needs a policy in like a day's time. So we assign someone who would work with the volunteer or the law firm to help with the, help them with uh, drafting the policy and then also at certain times we offer to do capacity building trainings along with the lawyers like say um, do the research for them or prepare the ppt for them in house which kind of motivates them to work more and give more pro bono hours because they know that they'll get the back end support and they'll get whatever uh, support that they require from the team. And it's just not that we put them on their own to complete a project. So that's something I think that actually helps and has helped us in our projects quite a lot. Just wanted to say that. Absolutely, thank you. Um, very interesting for me to know that, um, you know, I pro bono is having some kind of a hybrid model, if I understand this correctly, uh, where you to work as a clearinghouse as well as support on projects also. Um, thanks, Karavaki. Uh, I see Rob's hand is up. Rob, do you want to jump in here? Uh, just to to add, not a competing definition, uh, but uh, maybe to echo some of the the points that have been made here. Just a moment ago, we saw one of the the, the key issues that folks have been reporting in the course of today's discussion uh, facing pro bono today is business conflicts, business interests. You know, and that's the thing is that um, it's it's not so much um, uh, you know kind of a, um, the you know a barrier to to us working together across the board to get some of the great work done that people might like to do. It's just more part of the landscape that we need to understand and realize that the great tools that exist out there, that they're available, it's just that everyone has a different role to play. And I say that because I think it's important for us, coming back to the definition, to recognize that pro bono is not something that is just done through law firms. Pro bono is not something that is just done through bar associations, referred to clearing houses, done by civil society organizations. Pro bono is something that is personal. Pro bono is something that we all engage with 
And coming back once again to the question that was asked about how do you encourage pro bono? We should engage with it, not because we're going to, to get uh, recognized in some way or another in the course of our jobs, although that's great too. Uh, we should engage with it because it's professionally and personally meaningful for us that it helps us to engage in, in the conscientious practice of law on an individual basis. And that's something I think is really important for us to remember in the pro bono context is that it's so critical, so vital for us just across the board to encourage folks to engage with a freedom of conscience in uh, pro bono matters that uh, that allows people to engage with the 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 matters with the the clients and with the issues that we face in the world today as a human family uh, that that really resonate with them. That's so important. It's so important, and I say I know that we're going to come to this issue in a minute, but um, I, I think it's really important just to recognize coming back to that kind of broader landscape that there are some things that large law firms will do fantastically well. There are some things that uh, smaller firms might do really well. Um, there are some projects that are difficult. You know, if you have business interest of some kind or another, uh, or potential business interest, it's difficult for for you know firms. If it's difficult for one firm, it's probably difficult for a lot of firms to get involved in a particular kind of matter. And in those kinds of of, of situations, that's where that focus on freedom of conscience and on, on helping people as individuals to come together, whether it's in the course of working through a bar association or otherwise as individuals. Then, then that's really important, I think, for us to focus on that in the pro bono context as well. But that's what I would add just to that, that understanding of pro bono. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rob. I think you've given a soul to the definitions that we've just uh, you know, um, looked at. And um, I think I'm in love with the words freedom of conscience. Uh, great. Thank you so much, uh, Rob. Um, while we still have you, um, you know, with us in the spotlight, um, let me pose the next question to you. Um, so can you tell us how clearinghouses and bar associations have worked together to support legal teams in building and strengthening their pro bono commitments? Uh, and perhaps also, where do you see the future of such collaboration between clearinghouses and bar associations? Absolutely. So we're talking about the future of, of bar associations and clearinghouses and firms. Some folks may ask, well, gosh, um, you know, we see all of the great work that is being done around the world by maybe some of the large firms. Um, why is it the case some folks may think that we don't just leave it to them? Why don't we just let large firms uh, be the ones that, that carry the pro bono, you know, uh, um, banner forward? Why do we need bar associations? Why do we need clearing houses? Uh, but it really does come back. I, I think I, I just took a quick look at the at the list of, of the issues that people you know reported facing when it comes to pro bono, but I did see, I think maybe five times in that short list, and I think it may be the number one reason uh, that people face challenges from that list that we saw earlier today, uh, that people really have an issue, they're struggling with business interests in, in conflicts. Now, uh, like I say, you know, there you can look around and you can see so many large law firms around the world are doing so much great work. Uh, you know, we have DLA Piper here on the panel today. Uh, sorry, not the panel, in the discussion today. We have lots of great work that's being done by large law firms. And you can see on the websites where they're saying, look, this is the kind of commitment. They're sharing their ideas. They're sharing their impact. All of that is fantastic and great. It's also the case that you will find sometimes where it may be difficult, like I said a minute ago, for, for one particular firm, you know, because maybe it's 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 got clients in a particular sector and it's thinking, well, gosh, it's difficult for, you know, firm X to get involved in that sector. Maybe we'll look and put our focus somewhere else in, in our pro bono kind of, of uh, engagement as a firm, you know, wearing our hats as a firm. They may think that in one firm. And if they think that in one firm, they may think that in the next and the next and the next until you have a kind of a of, of, of really um, a challenge sometimes, engaging with certain issues, maybe engaging where it may be politically uh, sensitive, maybe engaging where there may be issues that, that once again relate to uh, clients that are, that are often involved with lots of global firms. Uh, you know, environmental justice is a good example. In some of these areas, then it really, really is necessary to have bar associations, clearing houses, where they can take requests for support from NGOs, from folks on the ground who are saying, look, I need help. I know it's a politically sensitive matter. I know it's a, a, an issue that's hard for, you know, maybe the commercial practice and the entities of, you know, in the global practice of law to get plugged into. I really need help. 
we need those clearinghouses and those bar associations to take those, those requests for support and to say, we hear you, just like trust law does, and to say, hey, let's let's send this out to a broader audience. Let's see if if certain firms are having challenges. You know, it's it's often the case you'll have firms that are understood more to be on, on the you know defense bar. Some are more on the, the plaintiff's bar, if you want to think of it that way. Maybe if, if certain firms are having challenges, maybe others will be able to engage. That's a, it's a great and important function, such a critical function that clearinghouses face or, or, or provide today. Bar associations, similarly, if commercial entities in the practice of law may have challenges in one way or another with commercial business ent entity or um, 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 as commercial business entities, well, then, gosh, if you have a bar association, whether it's a local one or whether you have you know something like the Global Criminal Bar Association bringing folks together as individuals around the world in different jurisdictions as individuals. In, in either of those cases, you have an opportunity to take some of those matters that might be difficult to find a home in pro bono practices and to, to start to reach out on an individual basis and to once again, returning to the idea of freedom of conscience, to bring together folks, whether they're you know, professors, whether they're students, whether they're in different law firms, whether they're usually competing with one another to get work. They might come together in a different context, helping out in a bar association to try to move projects forward uh, where they might not otherwise be moved forward in, in the commercial practice of law. That's what I think is, is, is the value that's brought. I also think that's what the future is, because a lot of the largest problems that we face in the world today as a human family will not be addressed except through the conscientious exercise of, of, um, uh, of personal engagement in a pro bono context by some of the folks who are in their day jobs active in the, the commercial legal profession or, or, or practice of law. Those folks are the ones working together with bar associations, with clearinghouses, with large law firms, with small firms, with, with lots of us across the spectrum in the global legal profession. Those are the kinds of, of collaborations that will help to address some of those bigger problems that we face as a human family. And that's the future, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I think you made a great point about clearinghouses and bar associations presenting a possibility for collaborations that might not otherwise have happened. Um, I, I I saw Benita's hand was up. Benita, do you want to come in? Thanks, Anita. Just to add to what Rob said, completely agree with you in terms of you know working uh, across the board, uh, not just with law firms, working with bar associations. We we do the same with our community of uh, you know lawyers. We work with law students as well when when needed. So when there are particular projects that includes a large number uh, where we need a large group, whether it's for translation or whether it's for research purposes, we can rope in uh, law students. We work with barristers, advocates when the same the same thing that Rob mentioned when there's a conflict of interest where firms cannot get involved, we can we can use those tools of people. We work with academics. Uh, we work with retired judges in certain cases. Uh, when we needed uh, their expertise on certain projects. So it's to use that whole pool of legal community uh, as and when needed in different jurisdictions so that you come across, you come together seamlessly to take the project forward. So I think it's, it's, uh, I think it's a great point that we need to work across the board um, and come together to take things forward. Absolutely. Thank you, Benita. So um, while we are talking about, uh, you know, bringing in resources across the board, uh, perhaps I can ask Adrian more specifically about perhaps providing an insight into your firm's pro bono resources and uh, maybe also giving us an insight on how do you evaluate pro bono work your lawyers um, do? Sure. Um, we do have a very interesting conversation and there's a lot of things I would like to address before we get into um, what you want to hear from me on those topics. Um, so first of all, we wish to highlight that like we also see like pro bono is the responsibility of every lawyer, not just a large, large firm. Um, so that's why we do not see like only large firms should take up all the pro bono work as well as it's not possible for us to do that. So that's why we really um, highlight and emphasize the importance of collaboration within the different, uh, within the legal, uh, legal profession, uh, no matter with so small firms, with in-house lawyers, uh, with NGOs or with clearinghouse. So, uh, we do think those partnerships is very important uh, to us. Um, after all, we share the same goal is to build a better environment and better society for the community that we care a lot. Um, and also, 
it's really true that we do not see uh, pro bono as a charity. Uh, we really, really see that it's a commitment. DA Piper is very proud to say that uh, pro bono culture is part of our DNA. Uh, we encourage all, all lawyers um, to do at least 35 hours of pro bono work every year. That is a voluntary target. Uh, but at the same time, that is a um, direction handed down by our London headquarters, by the senior management. So uh, it applies to all of our DI Piper's office. We have 40, uh, we, have con- we have offices in 40 different countries with around three to 4,000 lawyers. So all lawyers are expected to meet target. Um, in terms of the resources that we, we have, so first of all, we do have a uh, very detailed pro bono policy. I think it's similar to Rob, uh, to what, uh, what Jonita and Rob has said. Uh, we, uh, we think that it should be, has to be for public good. It needs to be supporting uh, access to justice and also need to help enhancing uh, the rule of law in different communities. We also talk, uh, tell um, colleagues what is qualified as pro bono work, what is not qualified for pro bono work. So we, we really need to see that uh, public element and the public benefit from our pro bono work before we can qualify it as a pro bono uh, matters. Um, one thing um, I think we are very proud of ourselves is we do have a um, full-time dedicated pro bono team uh, managing this uh, pro bono practice. I'm a, pro bo- I'm a full-time pro bono lawyer, so I, I, I'm lucky enough not to have billable target. Uh, I can focus on uh, pro bono issues um, in Asia and help our colleagues to, uh, to find the right projects and also find the uh, right opportunity to, to work on and support the community and the issues that they care. Um, we do that because like, uh, we really see there's a, a strong business case of doing that. Having a full-time pro bono team is not, it's expensive, um, but at the same time, it's, like, it's a very uh, worthwhile investment because we do see like clients are, interest, clients are interested in seeing that we have a strong pro bono practice. They would like to see that we are good corporate citizens. And our colleagues would like uh, uh, are happy to see that if their employer um, is a co- is a good corporate citizen willing to give back to the society, and also that allows them to give back to the society as well. And lastly, our future um, potential um, candidates, um, our future employees, are also interested in seeing that like we are a good employer, we share the same values with them. Um, so this is the reason why Propdia Piper is willing to invest more and more on pro bono. Um, but at the same time, it's quite difficult for me, for example, based in Hong Kong to manage like the pro bono practice in all our seven offices. So we also have a local coordinator system. So um, the local coordinators facing each individual office is acting as a middleman between the pro bono team, the central pro bono team, and, and the local office. So we will uh, bring projects, uh, we will send projects to the local office through the coordinators. Coordinators will help with recruiting volunteers, managing the colleagues, and also um, see how the things work. Uh, and also we expect coordinator will provide feedback to us um, regarding what the colleagues, uh, sorry, what the local office think about um, our pro bono practice, what they think about um, our practice, whether these are the top, uh, these are the projects that they're happy to work on uh, or fit into their, their, their profile so we can make the um, relevant adjustment. Um, and we also like require like, partners to provision in all of our projects. So, um, so the local partners will be in charge of every pro bono matters. Uh, so they can, they can making sure that the, the quality of the service that we provide um, even though the, most of the work may be done by a junior lawyer, but at least the quality, the output is uh, the, the output will meet our uh, day hyper uh, standard. Um, lastly, in terms of recognition, um, we um, allow colleagues to record their pro bono time into their system, and also we may uh, consider whether there's any ways, uh, different kinds of like uh, rewards to them, for, uh, thanks for them. Well, thanks for their, their service on, on pro bono matters. Uh, we also uh, encourage uh, colleagues to apply for um, external recognition program. For example, in Hong Kong, the Law Society has their annual pro bono program. Um, so, uh, sorry, annual pro bono recognition program. So we encourage um, colleagues to apply for those recognition program, not 
necessarily looking for the award, but at the same time, it's good to let the society know like what they have done, and and in case the society thing is is they think it's fit, so they can show their recognition to our colleagues as well. Um, so um, and also from time to time, we will try our best to bring our colleagues to see the impact of their work. Um, for example, recently we uh, represented um, NGO in Hong Kong. Um, on their affordable housing, uh, on the affordable housing projects. Uh, so we provide like real estate law uh, on on the on this project for the NGO. And when the when the building when when that project is open, when the building is ready to welcome uh, tenants, uh, we invite our colleagues to to visit that site and let them see that that's actually this is the thing uh, that you contribute to 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 succeed. So hopefully that kind of um, like very direct, um, direct um, witnessing of the impact can, can also encourage them to work more on similar projects and also help them to build the understanding and knowledge in this area. So when they provide the pro bono service, um, they can uh, be in a better position in understanding the client needs. So um, I hope that I have addressed that all the all the. Uh, Issue that you raised, but in case you have any, in case there's anything I have uh, missed, us, just let me know. I'm more than happy to share more about our pro bono practice. Um, absolutely, thank you so much, Aaron. You've been very comprehensive, and I think um, for the legal teams in the room, uh, no matter their size, I think there's always there's something to take away from um, everything that you've just mentioned on how DLA Viper uh, structures their pro bono work. Um, okay, um, just, I'm just gonna quickly check in with anyone in the uh, among the attendees um, or even co-presenters if they have any additional thoughts on this before we go on. I think I just want to add on one thing. I think Rob mentioned about the big firm, small firm collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, I think today, Hyper, we are really happy to, to see this happen. Uh, we know there's a lot of firm that's working very hard on the on 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 various issues, for example, LGBT plus refugees issues, and um, they may have they may have limited manpower. And compared to us, we have a larger team. So uh, we are happy to see um, any kind of sharing of their workload. Uh, we are just want them to like when the case goes well. Um, well, the example that I have is like when I was uh, when I am in Hong Kong, I was right, uh, working on a case um, that is a sexual harassment complaint. Uh, so we provide the first stage of like pro bono service, uh, letting the clients have some like basic advice, uh, providing those like prepare the initial uh, complaint form and, and also represent the client at the like first stage of the of the of the like complaint uh, proceedings, and when the case moves to the second stage, and we think that it's better to have an other law firm to work on, or someone with like more experience in 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 that area, like especially in the litigation of those issues, uh, we think we are more than happy to just pass on the case to the. Uh, to the to the uh, to the new lawyer to to pick up that matter and continue to work on the case. So uh, we hope that like the work that we have done in the first stage will save a lot of time and resources of the lawyer in the second stage. So um, I and also I think that this is a very good um, examples of like division of labors. So um, each of us can contribute our the best that we can um, to to help the client the most. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Um, sorry, I see Rob has raised his hand. Do you want to come in here, Rob? Uh, yes, please. Uh, so let, let me just say something quickly on, on some of the excellent comments that Aaron has just made. Uh, I think it's really important for us to, to keep in perspective. You know, we're all coming from different perspectives. You know, some folks are working in big firms, some folks are working in smaller firms, some in civil society organizations of one type or another, some government. I think it's for it's important for us to keep in perspective um, how um, the 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 cost to us for pro bono is different. You know, we're often talking about how uh, pro bono is something that you know we all should do, and the, the business case for it, all those sorts of things. But gosh, there's also a cost, and uh, and that's worth paying. That cost, uh, you know, I mean, as as Aaron has just said, hey, you know, Aaron, I think even mentioned, hey, you know, 
DLA Fiber's made this commitment. There's a cost involved to it, and their firm has made that, that commitment. That's fantastic. When I think of small firms in this small firm collaboration context, I think about how sometimes in some ways it may be easier for large firms to say, well, gosh, we've made a global commitment where we're going to go out and do this, this pro bono work. You know, across the board, many, many firms have made that kind of strong and laudable commitment to pro bono from their global operations, empowering their, their associates and partners to uh, maybe work 50 hours you know, per year or to meet some other standard or, or whatever, to move the ball forward for their, their kind of uh, global firm practices in pro bono. If you're in a small firm, on the other hand, then taking on a pro bono commitment is a one-off decision. It is, it is a commitment. It really is a commitment because you may have just a handful of folks. You may have five, eight lawyers. You may have fewer lawyers. You may be a solo practitioner. Working with just a small team, those folks, while they're working in that pro bono matter, it takes time and they're not able to work on billable matters. And so there's really a commitment that I think needs to be re you know, recognized and, and appreciated and, and um, we can't speak enough about it uh, from the small firm perspective, as far as giving back to pro bono. There's such a value, like Aaron has just said, in bringing the large firm commitment to pro bono globally, where a lot of times, you know, large firms won't necessarily have local offices in particular jurisdictions, especially some of the jurisdictions where, that are in the greatest need, you know, for in some respects, there's need everywhere. But there are, are in some ways, some jurisdictions where um, pro bono is in, in really dire need. The large law firms have the ability to engage with matters like that. They don't necessarily have ready local law capability. Local law firm partners working with large law firm partners, maybe through the facilitation of, of bar associations or clearinghouses, that's really key. And it has such great potential where people can come together, offer the cost or, or offer to pay the cost that applies to them, whatever it is, whether that's a global commitment in a global firm or whether that is the, the painful decision to say this team will stop looking for new paid work or stop working on paid work and focus instead on this matter because we think it's important because it helps us to make new new friends you know through the pro bono space for whatever that the the, the kind of initial impetus is for making that decision we should recognize those costs and also the potential power that comes from those kinds of collaborations thanks those are very great points rob and aaron um i think I guess this is where clearing houses could potentially play a large part, considering that we have uh, an insight into you know the large law firm resources, the smaller law firm resources, and um, I think this is something that all clearing houses also do um, as a part of their work, creating those connections um, and collaborations where the need is. Um, I know we're a little tight on time, uh, but so, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip one question that we prepared for, and I will jump to the last one um, and wish, um, perhaps you can jump in here um, with you know, uh, your response on how uh, do you, you know, uh, uh, support on unexpected or emerging crises and how has that uh, impacted your ability to do pro bono? Thanks very much. And I think, um, you know, if there ever was a period where uh, we've had constant demands for emerging crisis, I think the last few years have really been that, you know, first the pandemic, and a number of other things that have happened globally, and, uh, um, you know, they've, they've really been challenging. And I think one of the things that we felt is the need for our lawyers to be there on, um, you know, on the ground, as well as in other areas. So I think one of the challenges uh, that I must talk about is how complicated uh, the legal landscape is. And because, uh, you know, A4ID, of course, now has operations uh, across continents. And one of the things that I'm sure you would also agree and sort of uh, perhaps feel on a daily basis is how complicated the matrix is. So for instance, in India, there's no distinction between uh, solicitors and barristers. Uh, the firm structures are very different. Foreign law firms are not allowed. Uh, so we work with these different kind of landscapes which allow a uh, great opportunity, uh, but sometimes are also a bit of a challenge because you, know, you are really not uh, sure who to reach out to and how and when, especially when time is of the essence. Uh, now, one of the things that we have been working on is, um, for want of a better word, creating a 
task force, urgent needs task force, which really responds to uh, demands and challenges as soon as we hear from them. And one of the things that we do is, of course, there might be some things, for instance, if um, something's very, very time sensitive, then we would pick that up before uh, we would look at other uh, aspects and other things um, necessary. So I think that's one of the things that we've worked on. Uh, the other thing we're also doing is our repository of um, reaching out to as many firms as we possibly can across the globe. I mean, uh, you know, increasing our network and making sure that we are in touch with uh, all the firms and every uh, firm is being engaged and we are in touch uh, with a variety of you know, terms that, that deliver on different uh, topics. But I think one of the other things that we've also started um, doing, and this is something uh, which we did, uh, you know, even previously, but now it becomes, it seems to be an even more um, sort of prominent thing, is uh, actually engaging individual councils uh, and individuals, uh, not just from uh, firms, but also from the other legal sectors, because uh, we do think the academics and others also play a very crucial role in making sure that uh, rule of law is really met in that, you know, because uh, the theory of change then becomes a more uh, prominent thing and also more sustainable thing. Uh, I think the last thing that we are continuing to do is that we uh, engage with all our partners and all our uh, development as well as our legal partners in a way that is very sustainable in the sense that we don't want it to be only a project-based relationship. Sometimes it might be, but so be it. But our idea and our ideology is really to have longer lasting, more sustainable partnerships where we can strengthen our relationships to come to conclusions that are meaningful, impactful, and the experience on both sides is one that can be a longer lasting experience. So I think these are three of the four things that we've uh, done, and I hope that answers your question, including, uh, I mean, some of the challenges and I'd like to hear uh, from the others as well as to what it is that they think is the biggest challenge, for instance, uh, and, and others. So thanks very much, it's back to you. Thanks, Vish. Um... And perhaps we can move to Vinita and Karavaki and see what they have to say about um, some of the ways they support um, or some of the ways that unexpected or emerging crisis has been impact their ability to support. Um, Benita, do you want to come in here? Karavaki? Thanks, thanks, Nandita. Thanks, Vish. Uh, Karu, do you want to do you want to start off and I can go next? Um, sure, Benita. Thank you, thank you, Nandita. Thank you, Vish. I think um, a lot of what Vish said about uh, building a relationship with partners is what we are also doing these days is that it's not just a project to project, um, you know, uh, partnership. It's something that we built through years. And uh, this helps us during um, emergent crisis because then we are able to build trust with them. And uh, in a way that they trust us with the uh, coming to us with uh, prop their problems. As uh, Benita is showing that slide uh, of our emergency relief campaign that we started during the COVID-19 pandemic, this was when um, most of the organizations that we work with came to us with uh, their problems. And they said that the most important thing that uh, they lack at this time is that they, their uh, you know, people on the ground, they need food, they need medical support. They need things like, um, you know, in, in terms of, um, uh, say, COVID uh, relief and stuff like that. So that is when uh, we did we, we did also reach out to new organizations on the ground. And uh, we, we found out that they also need similar kind of support in grass, on the grassroots levels, on, in places that are uh, remote areas, in uh, smaller districts in various states of uh, India. So we started this campaign, which is generally not a part of high pro bono structure. We do not do uh, fund relief, uh, you know, relief um, campaigns, but then we started this. And this was something that um, took a very long time to end also. It started with, you know, the first phase and we thought it'll end in say a few months, but then it, uh, you know, it became a full-fledged campaign where we started with the first phase, second phase third phase and then we recently uh, com concluded the campaign with the fourth phase so i i think that a point about building partnerships is uh, is very important and we strive to form a collaborative relationship with them and uh, the other thing is that um, for instance uh, even the day to day projects uh, like a housing rights vertical whenever we take up a case which is uh, 
which needs immediate attention what happens is that we have to literally drop off uh, other projects like uh, when i manage housing rights vertical in our organization so when an urgent illegal eviction uh, case comes up that needs my full attention for say mm -hmm. a period of two weeks at a time or three weeks at a time so that becomes a crisis an immediate crisis to handle where at least two to three members of the team have to give full attention and then uh, the other projects take a step back and we need to give our full attention to this uh, particular mm -hmm. housing rights case that is there in our hands so this is the ch challenge and then through teamwork is how we try to deal with that because we have an in-house team of lawyers who are dedicated uh, to do pro bono work and not just uh, external uh, volunteers or network of lawyers. So it kind of becomes easy for us to be able to deal with such crisis. Uh, then I'll also like to add on to the impact uh, bit that Rob and uh, Aaron had uh, pointed out is that um, just just I'd like to take this opportunity to mention that is one example is uh, in one of our housing rights cases uh, in uh, in one successful litigation, we were able to secure uh, adequate housing for around 600 uh, residents, which was a great, you know, huge victory. And the lawyer, the panel lawyer that was involved in the case, uh, we kind of made uh, tried to put her in touch with the clients there, the residents in the Basti whom we helped in uh, securing housing for. And that that made a huge impact on uh, her interest to do more pro bono work. And uh, she, she uh, kept on asking us for more housing rights work and expressed her interest in doing pro bono work. So that point of actually putting forward the impact in front of uh, the lawyers who are uh, willing to do pro bono actually helps a lot. So I'd like to end on that. And uh, Benita, please go ahead and add your points to that. Thanks, Karwaki. Um, um, sorry, Benita, just quickly. Sure. I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not sure if I'm showing the right slides, so please forgive me. That's fine. I think this was just, we just wanted to show uh, the emergency relief campaign that we we undertook over the last couple of years when COVID hit. As Karwaki said, when we reached out to partner organizations in terms of what support we could offer when the pandemic hit, the, their foremost request was to make sure that there was food available uh, and we were we could get involved uh, in emergency relief. And even though that's not a core part of our work, we had to get a task force going, we got funding, um, found suppliers, we had to get people who could go in for food inspection. Uh, so this is just uh, uh, some pictures to show that. And as Rob mentioned earlier, the definition of pro bono is really very wide. Uh, and obviously this involved a lot of different people getting involved uh, on the pro bono side. Um, and then taking things forward from there in terms of advocacy, policy on the ground where our teams could get involved as well. So it wasn't just providing food on the table, which was obviously the immediate need, but then taking things forward um, from, from there. And we, we continue to work with a number of those these partners in remote parts of India on other aspects, whether it's litigation or whether it's policy and advocacy. So yeah, you could stop sharing the slide now if you want. Back to you, Nandita. Thank you so much, uh, Benita. Um, and it's really interesting. It's an interesting point you made about showing lawyers the impact on the ground that can act um, as encouragement for more pro bono work. Um, Aaron, I believe you had um, something to add with your response to the Afghan crisis. Um, so perhaps we can um, have Aaron in quickly and then we can yep. try to kind of wrap up uh, with just another sure. small act. Sure, just quickly uh, on the Afghanistan project that we did around this time last year, it's, um, it's a collaboration to respond to uh, in, uh, urgent crisis. So uh, last year, our UK team um, worked on a project with a number of law firms uh, using the firm um, technology, project management, and legal resources, uh, resources to create a central platform for Afghans to um, get the most relevant FIs and connect them to the most relevant FIs. So uh, we pull out the team within a very short period of time and also we work very hard during that period around the clock to make sure that we provide the most updated FIs to the Afghan uh, refugees when they, uh, after they left the country. So um, this is one of the examples showing that how like our firm can put in resources of our own and also working with other lawyers on emergency uh, matters. And just want to add that like, uh, when we work on a project and responding to um, like pressing crisis, we also think of a very comprehensive approach. So this project doesn't stop at providing 
uh, providing um, legal advice, but we also try to see what next when the person uh, arrived in the UK or European country. So uh, connecting with others kind of supported organization as well. So um, yes, this is how we approach uh, 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 urgent crisis. So back to you. Thanks, Aaron, for sharing um, that. I believe, Vish, you have your hands up. And like you said, you get 50 seconds. Yes, 50 seconds starting now. I think first of all, I must congratulate um, on the urgent relief that happened on the ground. It was really, really impactful. I think the other thing uh, which uh, we are also working into our long-term strategy is to actually, I mean, as much as one needs to admit it, natural calamities, climate disasters are going to increase and research shows that is are going to be the case. Conflict might increase and hopefully discrimination, etc. Those are the things that would go down. Uh, so one of the other things that has part of our embedded long-term strategy is to actually have resources. So for instance, we yesterday talked about our, our sustainable legal initiative where we are really calling people. So before the conflict happens, we have you know, something that is going to be helpful to you and to actually stop it rather than to be only responding to once things happen. So we are also bring, trying to bring in that change, uh, which is a model which looks at prevention rather than only intervening when uh, things go wrong. So uh, that's another part of our strategy. Thanks. Thanks, Vish, uh, for sticking to time. Uh, Benita, you have your hand raised. Uh, we'll go to you and then we'll do a little bit of a wrap up uh, because we're kind of over, almost at time. Yeah, sure. Benita. Just, th just 30, th 30 seconds. So in, in just to add to what Vish said, when it comes to uh, crises or you know emergencies on the ground and uh, what Aaron said as well. So we worked on an Afghanistan evacuation program working with women cyclists who we evacuated uh, over the last one year, we supported them uh, with their journey into Pakistan and then now uh, moved uh, uh, over 80 of them to Italy as part of the humanitarian corridor in July. Um, but a, a, a big part of this was we were able to do quickly was because of the internal processes that we have in terms of due diligence, whether to take on a project and to do a risk assessment uh, on the ground as well. Uh, so obviously then we're able to move as quickly as needed and get the task force going, whether it's internal or in getting external partners involved. But I think it's very important for organizations or clearing houses to have this kind of due diligence process in place because otherwise everybody wants to take part because we, we know that if we don't step up, there might, you know, nobody else might. Uh, but it's to make sure that we've got the, the right tools in place to be able to take on, uh, you know, a project of this size. Thanks, Benita. Uh, and we have two minutes left for the session. Um, we had a whole breakout session plan, but let's skip that and let's modify. Uh, you know, we need to sometimes adapt. Um, so I quickly want to go across to all of the co-presenters and even attendees, if you want to jump in here with one sentence recommendation on what clearinghouses can do more to support uh, you know, the pro bono ecosystem and growth of pro bono ecosystems. Someone wants to start? Well, my one sentence is early preparation and long-term partnership. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Karuvaki, your hands up. Don't my bother one... with hands, just jump in. <laughs> sure, thanks. Thanks, Anza. My one sentence would be uh, not just manage them, but also get involved and support them when they need that and encourage and motivate them to do more pro bono work. Absolutely. Thank you, Karamati. If I can jump in. Uh, so I would say that bar associations and clearing houses bring us together, both as individuals and as legal entities uh, across the global practice of law to do the work that's important in our world today. Thanks, Rob. And, mine, and mine would be be proactive, uh, meaningful, and engaging work of uh, the impact of which you see. I'll, I can jump in next. Um, I would say get involved in more training on the ground support and advocacy and policy where possible. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, just checking, Junita, do you wanna jump in here and perhaps wrap this up? So I I was uh, frantically typing down everything all of you were saying, uh, which thank <laughs> which you. <is> why. <laughs> but um, I mean, uh, this, this has just been fabulous and um, such a great learning for all of us. Um, I, I think we're all at that, um, you know, we're all at the pivoting point uh, when it comes to taking pro bono to the next level. Um, and, and I think with the efforts that each of us have made individually, 
um and now through consortiums and forums like this collectively we do have um you know it there's a more hopeful perspective uh, to towards uh, how how pro bono can um grow in in this region especially um and and so i think um what i would close out with is just um, a, a large appeal uh you know to 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 each of you who are present here today to kind of um be open to the partnerships i think it's it's very easy for us to get um caught up in technicalities of uh, of how we we work differently sometimes um but i think we have so much of space to find common area and work together um and and collaborate i i, I like what where, where trust law is limited i can most certainly see i pro bono and a4id kind of stepping up uh, in the clearing house space and i'm sure uh, you know uh, rob as you've suggested with with bar associations in fact um, that was one of the conversations we were having with the team from philippines who's at the conference uh, year is how we can you know look at them as the other resource beyond uh, what clearing houses can reach out to um and um, so so just like looking at how we find different ways to partner and collaborate I, I feel this this session is such a great reflection of that. Um, just seeing so many uh, speakers from different backgrounds in here um, has really uh, made made it so much more um, engaging and valuable. So um, thank you to each and every one of you for joining us um, today, and a special thank you to all our participants. Um, I, we've we've tried our best to have this as interactive as possible um and we really wish we had seen everyone here in person um but i but all of you have been great um getting your inputs on um chat has been wonderful i've also dropped in a link to a google document uh in case um you know those of you who were shy to speak uh, or didn't get the chance to speak because uh, there were so many of us speaking over here uh if if you have thoughts to add into that google document please feel free to kind of click on that link um in, include your thoughts in there we definitely want to take these suggestions to the asia pro bono consortium um and see how we can develop it uh, into some something that can be implemented um, beyond just you know smaller tools and resources that are available like on our website so um please do take the time i know it's close to lunch for all of us who are here in laos um so i i won't take more of your time but thank you very much for for being here today thanks renta and i echo everything that you've just said um there's some great collaborations already happening and like you said um it's just going to be taking it to the next level um thank you everyone thank you to the co-presenters and to the participants and attendees um for taking the time to um you know talk to us about this uh really important topic and see you on the other side thank you thank you very um, much thank you thank you thank you ibc secretariat for supporting us with tech thank you thank you Thanks, everyone thank you all <laughs> Bye bye. Thank you. Magic word, ah. Yeah.